financially if we can. Okay, let's stand together. 1 Thessalonians 1 and then 2 Thessalonians 1. I'm going to be reading the first uh, 10 verses of the first book and verses 3 and 4 of the second book. Okay, so 1 Thessalonians 1, starting at verse 1. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of our God the Father, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. So that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say anything. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Then over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, we read, We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is fitting, because your faith grows exceedingly, and the love of every one of you all abounds toward each other, so that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word today. Lord, what a wonderful, what a several wonderful passages of Scripture. We pray, Lord, that you would use these verses to speak to our hearts in this day and in this age. We welcome your Holy Spirit to teach us what we need to know. Lord God, help me to deliver this message with an anointing of your Spirit. Let it fall upon ears that want to hear, eyes that want to see, lives that want to change. And we give you all the praise and all the thanks for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> Yesterday was a historic day at the church. In case you didn't know, I want to tell you a little bit about it. We had our, our very first time ever vision casting meeting. I want to recognize Bruce Gwibb. Uh, he's not here this morning, but I want to recognize him for leading that meeting. He did it with, uh, with, uh, with, a, with a degree of excellence that was just phenomenal. And uh, there were about 40 people here. Uh, our leaders were here, uh, met church members, other people were here that were interested. And it was a time to, to focus in on what this church might look like next year or in two years or in five years. And uh, the important part of the, of the meeting was that every ministry that we have going, and there's probably 29 or 30 different ministries at the church, but every ministry will incorporate into their into their functioning, the theme, the overall theme of our fellowship. So I want to talk about that this morning uh, for several reasons. I want to give you a little bit of a history of, of how we developed or how the theme came to us before I tell you what the theme actually is, in case you don't know what the theme is. But you probably do if you've been here for a while. But if you're visiting, you came at a great time to hear this message. Um, Pamela and I came here in December of 2007, and after one full year of ministry, as we were preparing for the annual business meeting in 2009, which was in January, we were seeking the Lord for a word or a theme or a concept that could very succinctly describe what we do without it being burdensome or cumbersome. I've read some mission states, statements of churches and, uh, and they were very good, but you almost have to sit down for 10 minutes and think about it before you really understand it. We were seeking the Lord for something very simple, but very powerful. And uh, the word came to, to Pamela, my wife, and that word was grow. And the scripture reference was the second one that we read, 2 Thessalonians 
1, 3, and 4, where Paul says, I thank you all, I thank God for you all, because your faith is growing exceedingly, and your love to all is abounding. So that concept, faith is growing, and love is abounding, was like our, our theme for the church. And so we presented it at that, at that annual business meeting. And from the word grow, we developed an acronym. And each letter of that word, G-R-O-W, stands for something. And so we put together a sentence which very clearly describes two things, who we are and what we do. That sentence is, if you know it, say it with me if you know it, people grow at NLC. Very simple, very easy to remember. If there's any hard part about it, it would be to remember what the G-R-O-W stand for and how you can, you know, communicate that to someone that needs to know what we're all about. So today, uh, I'm going to preach on this subject um, so that everyone, uh, old and new to the church, can hear the pastor's heart as to why we exist, and also so that each one of you will be able to tell your families, your friends, your co-workers, your classmates, people in your lives, what we do here at NLC. First, uh, we need to look at our text to get a good foundation for where we're going. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, he, uh, Paul really commends these people, doesn't he? I mean, as I was reading verses 1 through 10 in the first book, I was, I was encouraged because He's really telling a good story about this church. And what a great testimony that this church has. Uh, just to go through it quickly, he says in verse 2, we give thanks to God always for all of you, and we pray for you. We mention you in our prayers always. Not bad advice in these days, you know, to thank God and to pray for one another. That's good advice. But he says in verse 3, he remembers without ceasing. You know, he remembers constantly their, their continued uh, work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope. Really good things that he's saying. Uh, verse 5, uh, our gospel did not come to you in word only, but it came in power of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and in much assurance because you knew what kind of men we were. In other words, they shared the gospel, they shared their lives, and they're testifying this church, these people really got it. How many of you know that's every pastor's dream? That everyone would get it. <laughs> And be on the same page and flow together and do a great work for God in their city, where they are. It goes on, at verse 6, they became, or you became followers of us and followers of the Lord. Remember, Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. And this church became followers of Paul as, as he and his companions followed the Lord. And, uh, and verse 7, so that you became examples of to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. Verse 8, uh, from you the word of the Lord has sounded forth, not only there, but in every place. Your faith has gone out. We don't even have to say anything about your faith because your testimony is ringing out through the whole community. All the cities are, are aware of your faith in the Lord. And it says in verse 9, uh, they, they talk about how we came to you and how you turned from idols to serve the living and true God, and how you are now living as you await his return. You know, every time there's been a revival anywhere in the world, there's always been a component of the preaching and teaching and the awareness of the church or the congregation that Jesus is coming soon. It seems like when people focus on the second coming, the return of Christ, we get a little bit more serious about our walk with God. And so I want to always, you know, keep that before us, Jesus is coming soon. He is coming soon. As someone said recently, too, uh, we, we're praying for a great move of God. You know what? There is a great move of God going on right now in our midst. The fact that this place is, has this many people says something about the move of God. The fact that last week, overall, the, both services, there were 250 people here. That's a move of God. So I don't know. I don't want to be, I don't want, you know, I don't want to say, oh, God, move, move. I don't want to miss what he's doing. He's doing it. He's at work now in our midst. So I don't want you to miss what God is doing. And then it goes over to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And uh, just to written a few months later, if you study the history of when these epistles were written, just a few months later, 
Paul writes to the church, I thank God for you because, you know, your faith is, grow, is it growing exceedingly. It's not just growing a little bit. It's growing exceedingly. And your love for each other is abounding to everybody. And so he had some great, great uh, things to say about the church of Thessalonica. Now, I want to address something quickly because two weeks ago, uh, last week we had our special guest speaker, but two weeks ago uh, I was talking about uh, the church and a definition of the church. And when we got into the, the parables and some of the things that Jesus was saying, like say the prodigal son parable, the church, you know, I believe the church is, uh, consists of those who are covered by the blood of Christ. I mean, ultimately, that is the church. Those who believe in Jesus, accept his sacrifice on Calvary, are born again. That is the church. That is really the pure church. But Jesus, you know, when you study the Gospels and how we presented things, and when you read the epistles, you, you must know that the church actually consists of the good and the bad. I mean, the epistles were written to the church, and there's a whole lot of correction in the epistles. So the church is, it's almost like a little play on words, not a play on words, but it's like a double meaning. The church is the blood-bought believer. But today, the church consists of the good and the bad. I call them the hangers-on, if you, if you want to get into it that way. Those that love the fellowship or love something about it, but they're not really committed to Christ. But you know what? Here's what I wanted to say. In the setting of faith growing exceedingly and love abounding, a love abounding among everyone, a person who's a hanger-on or just kind of hanging around is way more likely to surrender to the Lord than being around a situation where there's bitterness and arguing and, and, and cruelty to people and, and not being, or being judgmental to people. So I always say, you know what? A church now, a church in this age, should consist of saved and unsaved, actually, with the idea that one day, as we who believe that we are the true blood-bought church, as we are walking with Christ, and we're, we're, our faith, our individual faith is growing, our faith collectively is growing, our love is abounding to one another, that person who's a hanger-on, I'll guarantee sooner or later, something's going to click in their heart. And they're going to say, you know what? I want what you guys have. I've been hanging around the cross too long. I need to get on the cross and live my life for the Lord. So I, I believe that there's something about what Paul's saying here. So um, before we get into the acronym of GROW, I want to give you five quick characteristics of what a, what a New Testament church would look like. And I'm going to go quickly. Uh, this could probably be another sermon one day, but I, I don't want to do that. I want to get to the acronym. But the first characteristic of a church, a New Testament church, is that it grows. It grows numerically. It grows deeper in faith. It expands. The scripture reference would be, and we don't have to turn to it, but Acts 2.47. It says, the Lord added daily to the church those who were being saved. Now, I'm not saying the Lord will add daily, but the Lord will add to the church. The church is living. It's alive. As a living organism, it must grow and expand. In fact, if you look at the church overall across the world, it is growing. It is growing. It has to grow. So the first characteristic is that the church grows. Second characteristic is this. As it grows, it pushes back evil forces. Jesus said in Matthew 16, uh, verse 18, he said, I am building my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So you get the idea that as he's building and the church is growing, it's, it's, it's pushing back. The, the, the forces of, the, of Satan will not prevail. We're, we're prevailing against them, actually. We're going forward and we're pushing back the forces of darkness. I love that concept of the church. That's why I love being in church with the saints of God. Now, we're not perfect. We're guaranteed we're not perfect, but we're striving. And in this atmosphere of faith, we are actually pushing back the evil forces. We're pleading the blood so God could move in our midst. This is a wonderful situation. So the church grows, and as it grows, it pushes back evil forces. Number three is that the church <clears throat> carries the message of salvation. Out of all the things that we do, 
And we could feed people and clothe people and be nice to people and say nice things and do good works. And all. That's all wonderful. But the main thing that we do as a church is we proclaim the message of salvation. We, we proclaim Christ and him crucified. Matthew 28, Mark 16, go into all the world, preach the gospel, teach the disciples, make disciples, baptize them, and, and keep doing it until Jesus comes back. So we, our, our purpose is to proclaim the message of salvation. Then fourth, uh, the church uh, safeguards the truth of God's word. You know, this is, and I've been in ministry for a long time, but I'm still in awe over the responsibilities that are attached to being a minister or being a Christian, actually, not just a minister, but being a Christian person. Because being a Christian means you're part of the church. And every Christian has an obligation to safeguard or to protect or to, or to, to keep pure the word of God. Scripture reference would be 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, where Paul says to Timothy, commit these truths to not just anybody, but commit these truths to faithful men who are able to teach others. In other words, what you have is precious and powerful. It's gold. It's golden. And don't just give it to anybody, but give it to people that are sold out and committed to the cause that they could safeguard the purity of the word of God. So a function of the church is to safeguard the truth of God's word. And the last thing would be uh, to edify the saints slash discipline the unruly. Everyone say unruly. There's some unruly people in the church. And not just of today, it's always been and it always will be until Jesus comes back. But I always believe unruly, unruly people make wonderful Christians once they get, once they get tamed. <laughs> you know, it's like a wild horse. You know, a, a wild horse is of, of, worth, of no worth at all whatsoever. But when a wild horse is tamed, they become powerful and strong, able to do a work. And, uh, and, and many of us are like wild bucks <laughs> that have to be tamed. But anyway, a function of the church is to edify the saints and to discipline the, the unruly. Ephesians 4.11, uh, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, the Lord gave to the church apostles and evangelists and prophets and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry. So it, he's given to the church resources to train up and to edify the body of Christ that they could go out and do a work and at the same time to discipline those that need to be disciplined. So the church then is a, is a living, an awesome living organism created by God. By the way, church is God's idea. You know? So if anyone has a problem with the whole concept of church, just say, talk, talk to the founder. I have nothing to say. I'm just doing what he said. Talk to the one who made it. I didn't, we didn't make church. He made it, so talk to him about it. But it's a, it's a living organism created by God to accomplish his purpose until he returns and sets all things in, in place, restores all things. So we at New Life are on a mission to be the church that God wants us to be. So those five characteristics are part of what we do. We, we're, we're growing. We're trying to push back evil. We're, we're proclaiming the way of salvation. We're safeguarding the truth of God's word. We're um, edifying the saints, disciplining the unruly. But that is carried out, really, by, by staying true to our theme you could call it our mission statement. Um, and by the way, um, this mission statement, the first time I preached on it was in 2009, in May. I looked back at my old sermons and looked at it. And, and then the four weeks after that sermon, we preached on one letter. Like the next sermon was the G, and the next one was the R, the next one was the O and the W. I received an email uh, a few weeks ago from a teenager, a teenage girl. And she wrote me the, really the nicest letter I've received. But she asked me, what was our church all about? She said, before I come to visit, I want to know what your mission statement is. I want to know what you stand for. I want to know what your purpose is. And this is like a 14, 15-year-old girl. And I thought, this is really good of her to do that. So I went through the whole grow thing with her on, uh, through email. 
And uh, she received it, and she, she liked it, I guess, because she's been coming to the second service and coming to the youth group. So this, this thing could be really powerful if we get it in our heart and spirit. So I want to take the next, say, 20 minutes or so and go over the, the acronym with you. And so hopefully by doing this, you'll be able to get it into your heart and your spirit, and you'll be able to tell others what we are all about, okay? So the first, the first letter is G, and um, that stands for being grounded in the word. So whether you're new to the church or a new Christian or an old Christian and you've been a Christian a long time, no matter what age you are, because we have things for children and adults, but whatever status of life you come from, whatever background you have, it is vitally important for every one of us to get grounded in the Word of God. So one of our main functions here is to help people get established, get grounded in the Word of God. Scripture reference would be Psalm 119 and verse 105, where it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And so we believe very strongly, for instance, that if you're lost and confused, the word of God has answers for you. If you're tired and you're weary, the word of God has something to say to you. If you're hurt and lonely, the word of God speaks to those issues. If you're bitter and have anger in your spirit, the Lord can address those things and help you overcome those things. But we also believe that if you're successful and wealthy, the word has definite direction for your life as well. If you're happy and content, the, the word has an explanation as to what to do with your life. If you have a good marriage and have good kids, praise God. But the word of God has definite direction for your family. So the word is very crucial to us. Three things. Romans 10, 17, it says, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So the word of God is our source of faith. We need to get grounded in the word so that our faith will grow. Our faith will become established and, and be powerful, and be a powerful tool for our lives. The word of God is our source of joy. Psalm 119, 162, it says, I rejoice at your word, as one finds great treasure. Psalm 119, 162, the source of joy. And the word of God is the source of our salvation. 1 Peter 1, says, we are born again by the word of God, which abides forever. So we preach the word of God. We teach the word of God. We have special studies, topical studies, contextual studies. We meet at different times of the day and night to accommodate people so that they can hear the Word of God. And hopefully soon, we're going to have a midday Bible study during the week, uh, during a weekday, trying to work that out now. But the Word is included in everything that we do. Every ministry that we have incorporates the concept of sharing the Word of God and, and helping people get grounded in the Word of God. So the first building block or the first step that we would encourage people to get involved with when they come into the church is to have an awareness that the Word of God is paramount. There's, it's like a building block, if you could look at it that way. The first thing we have to do is get on the Word of God. So our purpose is to help you get into and get onto the Word of God. It is your source of strength and power, and it's the only thing that will never fade away. It will last forever. So we need to get started with it now and get into and get onto the Word of God. Okay, so that's number one, the G. Now from there we progress. I wouldn't even address the ROW until that is basically underway. That's the most important thing, to get grounded in the Word. But once we're grounded in the Word, we begin to think about the R word. And that R word stands for relationships slash caring, but relationships and caring. The church has always been about people. Somebody give me an amen. You know, the church is people. People grow at NLC. A church without people is a church that doesn't exist. So we would do well to treat everyone that walks through these doors with love and care and, and, and personal attention. Because everyone, every one of you, everyone that walks through these doors brings with them a lifetime of experiences and situations, and they're coming to the house of God 
to get touched by God. Every person that walks through these doors is a gift from God. Every person, and it's an opportunity for us that we, that we, we who are, you know, standing on the word and, and we're, you know, we're doing okay, it is our responsibility to embrace and love them. And, I, and as I say that, some of you are saying, Pastor Rick, I just want to go to church and worship God and go home. Well, you can do that. No one's going to twist your arm. But if you want to have a fulfilled life, we, we must do it according to the word of God. Again, the word of God. The word of God tells us, Jesus said, the scripture is John 15, 12. This is my suggestion. No. This is my commandment that I give you. I'm commanding you to love each other. Wow. Lord, I have to love that guy? I can't stand that guy. Well, yeah, you have to love that guy. Yeah, it's a command. It's not a suggestion. And then he says in John 15, 35, by this all will know that you're my disciples by the love that you have for each other. So there's something about this thing. As we love each other, as we embrace the body of Christ, which would incorporate excuse me, but the good, bad, and the ugly, if you know what I mean, the unruly and everyone else, we embrace everyone and we work things out. People on the outside will know that we're disciples of Christ. You know what's going to happen in that setting? People on the outside will say, hmm, I, I'm kind of curious about those people up there. You know, I want to know what's going on in that church. I want to know what's going on with those people. I think I want what they have. And so the word and, and the, the presence of the church will grow in the community as a result. So we have, as you know already, greeting times at the church. And I know it's become somewhat of a monster, but it's okay. We greet each other after worship. We greet each other during the offering. It's a time to meet people, say hello to people, and so forth. We have coffee times. Hallelujah for the coffee. Uh, <laughs> We have uh, several small group settings, you know, a small group Bible studies, men's group, women's group, youth group, young adult group. We have an overcomers group now that serves the purpose of building relationships. We have uh, empowered singles ministry, all these different ministries going on that serve a purpose of getting grounded in the word, but also serve a purpose of building relationships with one another. Because we believe strongly that we need each other. Jesus had 12 men around him. That says something. And three out of, the, out of the 12 were closer to him than the others. But it says something about relationship. So we want to help people build relationships. Uh, we'll have breakfast meetings, brunch meetings, baby showers. Uh, we'll have a missions banquet. We'll have a Valentine's dinner and so on. So after, after we, we accomplish the number one of getting grounded in the word, the building block, we'll put on top of that building block, building relationships. And, and at that point, we're on our way, pretty much. We're making good progress. Now, now, how long will that take? I don't know. For some people, it'll take just a short while to go from G to R. Other people will take a, a while. It may take months. It may even take years. Because some people will come in that are not comfortable with building relationships. They don't trust people. They may have had a bad experience with their church before or whatever. It's going to take time to cultivate a friendship and a relationship. So there's no time frame on it. So a person like that, we have to be patient with and just love them through and, and not expect too much. We can't expect too much too soon. Let the Lord do the work in that situation. But anyway, when, we're, when we got the G and we got the O, uh, the R, uh, let's see, G-R, okay. We got the G and we got the R. The next, the next letter, or the next step would be the O. And that O stands for outreach and sharing because see I wouldn't expect anyone I mean my own experience I never thought about anyone else when I first got saved I only thought about me because I needed all the attention I could get back in the day and to be honest with you I wasn't I wasn't worried about somebody else getting saved I, I was I was happy I was and that's it that's all I needed to know for the time but after a while I began to realize after I knew the word after I had some friends and so forth oh yeah it's time to reach out a little bit. It's time to, it's time to get beyond these four walls of the church and, and look at those on the outside. So, so we believe strongly that the O component is very crucial to a church. We get grounded in the word, we build relationships, then we start focusing on outreach and, and, uh, and sharing. 
Scripture reference would be Mark 16, 15, which is, which really says it all. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So the, the term the world, uh, you know, we take that literally. You know, we, we have home missions. We have foreign missions. But we also go into the world of, say, the nursing homes, the world of the drug addict, the world of prisons. We go into different worlds that are right around us. So we go into all the world to preach the gospel, but that takes on many different forms and many different styles of ministry. So, for instance, we'll support New Brothers Fellowship, which is a prison and aftercare ministry. We'll support locally. We will support New Life Home for Women up in Manchester, which is a home for women and children that are having difficulties in life. We'll support Teen Challenge Ministry. We'll support Potter's Wheel. Uh, we'll support Somebody Cares New England, which is a local ministry here in Haverhill. We'll support Common Ground Ministries. We have some representatives, Suzanne and Millie, from the thrift store, uh, from the cafe. We have a, a storefront church down there every Sunday morning. We support that. We, we're engaged in it. We believe that's our mandate, you know, to be a witness in our Jerusalem, our Judea, our Samaria to the outermost part. So we do a lot of local stuff. We do a lot of stuff in Massachusetts, and, but no, we're not limited to that because that wall over there is our, most of our missionaries, our foreign missionaries, that are all over the world. If you're here in November, we have our big missions map with the lights on it. There's probably 25 or 30 missionaries that we support at uh, $50 a month. So it's 25 times 50, do the math per month, which reminds me, I haven't said anything, but those of you that made missions pledges last November, thank you, and uh, keep it up, because we're in it now. We're, we're, we're using those pledges for our budget for this year. So uh, anyway, so we have our missions month in November, we have our missions banquet, uh, we have missionaries that come here to share their hearts with us. We have, uh, Wayne shared yesterday, Hopefully by next year, we'll be taking a missions trip to Haiti or somewhere to do a work for the Lord. I mean, why not? Many churches send people out to do a work. Um, but, but outreach also is, takes on different forms. Outreach could be sitting down with a drug addict downtown and just talking to someone. It could be sitting down with a prostitute and sharing the love of Christ with them. It could be talking to, to someone that's obviously, you know, confused or has a difficult time in life, maybe homeless. It's all outreach, but we believe strongly that a church, if we're going to be obedient to the word of God and fulfill our mandate to, be, to have faith growing and love abounding, we've got to deliberately, purposefully do these things. So it could mean giving someone a ride to church. It could mean taking someone for a doctor's appointment or buying someone groceries and dropping them off at their home. So these are all forms of outreach and sharing the gospel of Christ in practical ways. So there we have the process of grounded in the word, building relationships, now outreach. So you have, you have like three steps of the building. And the last step, the, the W part, we call worship with passion. And we add the words with passion because we don't want to just be we don't want to worship the Lord just like, uh, what's the word, just, uh, just because we have to. We want to worship the Lord because we want to. And so we worship with passion. But we believe that as we get grounded in the word, as we build relationships, as we're outreach oriented, all of those things lend themselves to be worshipers. Now we put a lot of emphasis on our worship times on Sunday mornings. Uh, Sunday night, Wednesday night, we always have the worship team. We always have the words and so forth. But can I tell you, that's just to kind of, that's just to get us acclimated to worshiping God. I hope and pray that when you go home today, some of the songs we sang or some of the awareness that, we, that we've had during worship, will carry, you'll carry that through the rest of your day so that you'll be a worshiper when you walk out the door. When you get in your car and drive home, you'll still be a worshiper. You won't be in a worship service, but you'll be a worshiper. And you'll worship God with a passion because it just seems like the right thing to do. And so we, we're teaching about worship. We're trying to teach songs and so forth. One thing I love about, about the songs that we sing, many times during the course of a day, 
in a week I'll be doing something and a song will be going over in my mind and I'll be all by myself just singing that song and humming along and sometimes I only get the melody but the melody itself will be a blessing to me because a melody could praise the Lord too so we, we really encourage people to become worshipers of God. And uh, it's not just, like I said, not just Sunday morning or during our, our times. Here's a, here are other ways to worship the Lord. When you study the Word of God, there's a component of worship in that. When you have coffee with a new friend from church and make arrangements to meet them somewhere or to, or to treat them somewhere, that's an act of worship to God. When you, when you get clothing for the poor, we you give food to the needy, it's like you're doing it to the Lord. You're worshiping the Lord in these acts, works of compassion. So whether you're at work or at school or uh, doing your shopping or whatever you're doing, let everything that you are be a worship to the Lord. Scripture references 1 Chronicles 16, 29. 1 Chronicles 16, 29, where it says, Give to the Lord the glory do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Notice that this scripture really says it nicely. Worshiping God entails giving something to God. Give to the Lord. Bring an offering to the Lord. Give something to God. Show God something. So it could be, a, it could be your voice. It could be your hands. It could be your dance. It could be a good deed. It could be a good word to someone. It could be something sacrificial. It could be your money. It could be your belongings. It could be your vehicle as you transport someone. But give something to God that will bless him. And it also says, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. It's got to be holy. It's got to be pure. We can't worship God on the one hand and have our hand in the world or our foot in the world doing some ungodly, immoral thing. It doesn't work. It, it, he doesn't receive it. It's like, it's confusing. It doesn't function. So worship the Lord in holiness, in purity. And, and as we do that, see, as we, as we do these four things, the, the grounded in the word, the relationship, the outreach, and worship, guess what? We actually do grow as people. We grow as a, as a person. We're on the way to becoming who God designed us to be. So, uh, so I believe, you know, strongly, and I want to thank the church for, for hearing this message today. For many, it's not a new message but uh, there is a new passion with it right now. I hope that now uh, you, you will be able to know what we're all about, what we do, how we do what we do. And hopefully everyone here that he hears this message will be able to communicate this to somebody else because sooner or later someone's probably going to say to you, what's going on at your church? What do you guys do up there? What, what is your church all about? Very simply, people grow at NLC people grow at NLC. Yeah, people get grounded in the word, they build relationships, they, we get outreach oriented, and we worship God. And that will start a conversation. Very simple. So I, I want to close with, uh, with something, but before I do that, I want to close with this first. <laughs> Two closings. Hillstock is coming. Okay? We're, we're, we're focusing on the second week of July. It's a Wednesday a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. For those of you that don't know what Hillstock is, it's our annual outreach to the city in Gar Park across the street from the library. Last year, what did we say? We had 1,000 people. Was it 1,000? That's a lot of people. That's a lot of hot dogs, right, right, Wayne? A lot of food, a lot of stuff, a lot of talent, a lot of ministries. But we're trusting God again for 1,000 people. I'm trusting God for 300 people that Sunday in church because people need to know that they can grow. Thousands of people in this community need to know they don't have to stay the way they are. They can grow. They can, get, they can begin the process of growing in Christ. Okay, James, do you have that thing? Or Danica? I, I, we have a, a, an illustration here to, to demonstrate what I just talked about. Hopefully it's going to work. So let's see. Okay, here we are. Grounded in the Word. First thing we do is we get grounded in the Word. So we've got the roots going. We get established as a person, as a Christian. Then we build relationships. Ah, now we've got some grass growing. We've got some branches up there on the tree. So we're, we're growing as a person, right? There's a, a scripture references. And then we go into outreach. Ah, now we've got some fruit. We've got some color in there. It looks really cool. 
And so, so we're getting established, and, and we worship the Lord. Ah, now we have more color. It's, it's like rich. It's like really nice. And then is there, I think there's something else that comes up. Oh, yeah, then we have other little sprouts coming up, and, and, and things are just happening. Things are just growing all around us. So that's our goal is to be a, be a full tree with all the trimmings around it, right? That's our goal, to be a, a growing church and a growing individual. Okay, so why don't we stand and uh, I, I'll give you this last verse. It's Second Peter 3, verse 18. Peter writes, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So when I read that scripture, it's not only a suggestion. It's almost like the Lord is telling us to grow. So grow in your knowledge of the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the word of God.